Yes. It's okay. Okay, introduce. <laughs> Start. Uh, we, we're actually a bit ahead, ahead of schedule. Um, so it's a pleasure to have uh, uh, Mark Mokli from, from Stony Brook University who will uh, tell us about birational Calabi yellow manifolds have the same quantum products. Right. Maybe I'll write that down. So that's what I want to uh, talk about today. The slightly older, well, result I showed maybe five years ago. Um, so I should probably explain some of these words first. So the first thing is what are we I just want to set conventions. So for me, uh, uh, Calabi Yau manifold and I'll just write CYM. For me, it's going to be a smooth projective variety. Uh, with um, trivial first chunk class. So let's see. Trivial first chunk class. So I have no restrictions on pi one and all this, but it's projected. Okay. Well, considering the conference has, the workshop has this name in it, you should, you should know what by ration is. In any dimension, you mean? Any dimension. So, well, you know what birational means, but maybe just to set conventions, I'm just going to, you know, so, 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 so two Calabi Yau manifolds, X and X check, birational. There exists co dimension one sub varieties B, yes, B check, X check, <clears throat> so that X minus V is isomorphic to X check minus V check. So I, you should all know this definition, but I'm just doing this to set notation. So we have X and V. V X check and V check. Okay. So an example, give you a sort of local example. This, this button should be the third one. Oh, now it works. Okay. A local example. Copy yeah. tier flow. Um, so, well, I'll just so we have say a P one inside X, P one inside X check, and they have normal bundles. O minus one plus O minus one. The sum has to be two minus two. And um so 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 well 
so, so the, the, the so, so um maybe I should yeah so so you have this o o minus one plus o minus one you have this vibration over p one and you have a sort of from the, the the total space of this you have a contraction to this sort of standard on degenerate singularity. And and you sort of you have a small resolution here to go from here, and then there's another small resolution going to here by sort of you swap the some of the variables. Um, so topologically, what's going on is you have P1, you have a neighborhood of P1, which looks like say the unit, you know, the unit, you, if you put a metric on this sum of vector bundle over P1, then, then you have um you know, like a small neighborhood is, is say, um, diffeomorphic to this. And then what you do is you remove that neighborhood and swap these two factors and you sort of glue it back in. So topologically, it's it it's a bit like um, in three manifold theory, you do zero surgery on a knot. It's a bit like knots, you're doing zero surgery. Okay, so we have this sort of local example. Great. So these are minus two curves or no no because it's three dimensions sorry this is club yeah, three three four sorry oh, sorry sorry okay. this is three, three okay. yeah so this is in three dimensions um, okay. thank you sorry i forgot about that um but i'm going to assume x next check have any dimension this is just an example oh no okay and the reason why I wrote this down is because we have a V in V check and there's a fact which is we're going to use later on um, we can assume the co-dimension for V in X and the co-dimension V check next check they're both greater than or equal to two. Morally, why is this? So, so this uses the fact that C1 is zero, C1 of X is zero. And, and the reason is because if it wasn't co-dimension greater than or equal to two, suppose it was co-dimension one, then, then some say component of V or V check has to be contracted. And if you contract some co-dimension one thing, you must produce some churn class somewhere. And that's the sort of morally the reason why it must be co-dimension two. And as I said, we're going to use this fact later on. So, so as a conclusion as well, we have that the H2. No, you said we can assume. So if, if it is of co-dimension one. Yeah, so so if it's co-dimension one, I can remove a chunk so it becomes co-dimension two and okay, extend so by small. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, these, these groups are the same. The cycle, say in this one, the cycles you know, the way this you don't know, interact with real co-dimension four. Oh, this camera doesn't do high boards, does it? No, you have to just have to. Okay, so to, uh, okay, so I'm only going to use the lower boards for the Zoom participants. That's usually we don't use uh, we don't write directly on the yeah, right up here. No, well, maybe you might be able to do this. Oh. <laughs> usually people don't. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. <laughs> right. Oh yes, actually, it's better not to write on the, the last blackboard because you have two that switch in front of them. Oh, you have two blackboards that switch. So then, oh, in any case, okay, so it's, it's better not to use the, the last blackboard because yeah, I, I'm trying to avoid that now. Okay. I, I didn't realize. You know, meet me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay, so we, these are canonical identifications of homology groups. So. So, so we have a general question, which is, 
what properties which properties do um, birational Calabi Al manifolds share have in common? You know, what do they have in common? So they have the same H2 groups. So you could ask about general homology. <clears throat> and then we have this theorem by Batirev. I have the same Betty numbers. And this was proven using something called piadic integration. And then Konsevich had another idea called motivic integration. So I'll write Konsevich. It's called motivic integration. And I'm not going to explain that, but there's some, um, there's this nice, if you're not an algebraic geometer, there's a very nice survey by Alistair Craw um, that I like. It's sort of readable for someone who's not fully algebraic. Are the Hodge numbers also the same? Yes, the Hodge numbers are the same too. And also, um, you can actually combine this motivic integration idea with ideas by uh, Gillet and Sol, Soule, um, to show that they have the same integral homology groups. So torsion. But, but the, the identifications are not um, canonical in any way. There's no map. You know, they're just the, they're just they're just the same as finitely generated Arvelian groups. So. Next thing you could ask is what about the cut product? And then the cut products are not the same. So, uh, I don't know who's who where the first example came from, but there's a there's an article by Friedman 91, example 7.7. You can look it up. I'm sure this older, this is just some example like someone told me about. I don't, I don't know if this is the first example, probably not. So, well, that's a shame, I suppose. <clears throat> but then there's this conjecture by Morrison. Well, I think Morrison conjectured this in dimension three and then Rowan in all dimensions, but, um, at least where this is written. Um, there, quantum, small or big quantum homology groups, homology algebras. The same. but up to some sort of analytic continuation, whatever that means. So um, this is a, a deformation of quantum cohomology. So it's sort of defined over like a power series ring or something like this. So, so the, the, the structure constants of our multiplication are power series. And you have to sort of you know, do a change of variables and analytically continue to get the other quantum cohomology rings or something. 
bang on identification, but there's a sort of nice sort of, uh, correspondence between these two algebras. So they're, they're basically the same. So I'll explain what small quantum cohomology is later. I could say something about big quantum cohomology that the, the result is much weaker. Um, so let me tell you what the status of this conjecture is. So Lee, number one, prove this dimension three. So in dimension three, everything is sort of related by something like uh, this. Sorry, uh, which Lee? <laughs> no, sorry? there are thousands of Lee. Which uh, Lee? Uh, um, good question. And Min, uh, and Min, and Min, and Min Lee, yeah. Min, no. oh. The one who okay. was one to define a relative core within the right? Okay, thank you, Lee. <laughs> no, and no, no. Oh, no, yes. and, and Min Lee. Yeah, and Min. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, there's a result by Yi Wow, Li, Lin, Yu, Wang. It's a series of three papers, with most of these authors in each paper. So 2011 to 2014. So true. If um, so, true for something for, for certain birational transformations called ordinary flops. So, ordinary flops are sort of generalizations of the Atiyah flop. And it's a sort of like you, you, you look at the example of the Atiyah flop, you think about what it looks like in higher dimensions, you know, PN, O something. And then do a sort of parameterized version of it, and sort of basically what an ordinary block is. There is a conjecture, maybe I sh should write, should write this. So there is a conjecture by Wang in 2002, which says, although I think algebraic geometers, I don't know if they've been skeptical of this conjecture, which is, I don't know. It's, it's after you deform these Kalabi Yao's X and X check sort of simultaneously, then the bi every birational transform composition of ordinary flops. Do you know that in dimension two it's more or less obvious or? In dimension two, yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, it, it, see, you see, you see, the, see this fact. V and v. Oh yes, then you have, yeah, then you have points. <laughs> then you get points. So. Quantum cohomology, thankfully, is a okay. holomorphic invariant. Yeah. <laughs> Right, that's all I want to say. So let me explain what small quantum cohomology is. Mark, wait, these results for small or quantum? Uh, but I think both big, yeah. But now I'm gonna just focus on small from now on. I'll say something about big at the end if I remember or have time. Okay, so now I can link to something. So X is our Kalavi Yau manifold. It's smooth projective, so I can choose a Kähler form. It's nice for it to be integral. You don't need it for the moment. It's cool. And I'm going to define this because it's Kalavi Yau. Define small quantum cohomology over any field or any ring, really. This can be done in the world of symplectic geometry. If you're an algebraic geometer, we have no idea why it would be defined over Z. No moral reason why it should be. 
that we know of synthetic geometry it is. So small quantum cohomology is a deformation of quantum cohomology, so it's defined over a power series sort of ring. So let me write down what this ring is. It's called the Novikov field. Maybe I won't put this K here. I'm just going to put lambda and we get X. So this is a collection of infinite sums. The A by coefficients of the, of the power series are in a field. The powers are in H2. Require that omega of the powers x a i go to infinity. Okay. So uh, maybe a more formal way of saying this is you start with the group ring of H2, then you complete it using omega x. So omega x gives you a sort of filtration. It's polynomial ring and you complete. You know, or you can think of this as a sort of valuation or something, you're completing with respect to evaluation. Okay. And well, quantum cohomology, um, it's it's the easiest way to describe it is you need to choose a basis for, for cohomology. So we're gonna let a1 a k a homogeneous basis. the cohomology of x coefficients in our field and then we have a corresponding dual basis so now the cut product gives you a bilinear, non degenerate bilinear form on cohomology, and uh, you take the dual basis using this cut product. Okay, so as a module, quantum cohomology, so this is going to be quantum cohomology. It's right here. Okay. Oh, no. So quantum cohomology of X with coefficients in this Novikov ring. Um, just as a module, this is just homology of X with coefficients in um, in in uh, coefficients in uh, Novik offering. But then there's this product which I write as star. And we just need to determine what star is on these basis elements, A1 to AL, AAN. I ask, so if I'm an algebraic geometer, I'm thinking of quantum cohomology usually with the effective classes, but you don't require that here. Is I'm it? not going to work in the cone of effective classes. I'm... So is this the same as, as taking the completion and then inverting? Yeah, yeah I'm inverting just inverting all of the effective classes. Um, it's a good question whether you could just work with uh, that. Um, it seems like the I don't know. I, it was a lot more rigid. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the problem is it's the the, the problem is um, you know later on I'm going to be doing some symplectic geometry and it doesn't tell you you, 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 you know at the moment we have holomorphic curves mapping to I haven't explained this but we have holomorphic curves mapping to X. But later on, I want to deform those equations to something else. Maybe non-effective curves will 
sort of appear, and I don't know if that causes problems or not. Um, so. so what's this product? So a I um, quantum cup product with a j is the sum of all classes beta in h2 of x z sum from one to k. And then we count the number of elements in some moduli space, a i, a j, a m. We multiply by a m hat times t to the beta. This is, these are the structure coefficients of our small quantum cohomology group. So this is the number of minus zero curves u one to x passing through a i so cycles one gray jewel to a i a j a n Okay. Yes. Why is there no beta in the coefficient or t? Oh, there's a beta here. Here's t to the beta. So, okay. Oh, and that this this is the number of curves of class beta. Oh, yes. okay. There you go. Yes. Very good. So, number of genus zero curves representing beta. Yes. Thank you. So there's this word here, count. Uh, geometers don't count like normal people, right? So if you have two submanifolds and you want to count the number of intersection points of two submanifolds, well, in this picture, it's infinity. You perturb it and it's finite and you count with sign. It's like intersection number. It's how geometers count. Okay. Great. Okay, so now I can state the main theorem. Uh -oh. Why does the J doesn't appear? I know. J, you mean the, almost the complex structure? Yeah, yes. The number of genus zero holomorphic. Oh, okay, it's there. Okay, sorry. Or some J. Generic J. This picture represents sort of graph of the D-bar operator, morally. Okay, so let's go to the main theorem. So before I state the main theorem, I need some setup notation. So I have X, X check their birational Calabi-Yau manifolds. They have Kähler forms, omega X and omega X check. I missed something. What is, uh, what is the general X? Uh... Oh. So, so, okay, so X, sorry, X check, they have birational Calabi Yau manifolds. Uh, any two. Any two. Two that are better. Any two birational Calabi Yau manifolds as I defined it. So, projective C10. with, And I choose two Taylor forms. Um, and I want these to have integral lifts as well. So I don't know if that's really necessary, but I'm going to assume that they have integral lifts. And I have my field K. And recall, so you can see this up here, but the people on Zoom can't. The H2 groups are canonically identified. So I'm just going to canonically identify these 
these groups. And as a result, I have two Novikov rings. I have, I have two Novikov rings. I have lambda omega x, and I have lambda omega x check. And because the two H2 groups are identified, I can compare these Novikov rings. Uh, no, sorry, uh, I missed something because I had to go outside. So just going back there, the um, last, the last is uh, the dual basis. So uh, where is uh, the, the yes? Just the last line there. Yes. Yeah, so you have the x. Uh, is it the x with the point or what is this? The x h star of x. Uh, x. Oh, that's oh, oh that, that's a dot. That, okay, but then what is? But then it's still in cohomology. Usually the dual basis basis is in homology. No, it's uh, yeah. But but I'm 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 using the so this is I'm working over a field and I'm using the Poincaré. I'm using okay, you use the Poincaré. Uh, so integral okay. alpha cut beta. This is the pairing that you okay, okay. So because these two things are identified, you know, I can look at their intersection. I have the intersection of the two. You know, if I want to compare two quantum cohomology groups, you know, these Novikov rings might be completely different. And pretty much all examples, they are completely different. So, well, to compare them, I need to do something. One thing you can do is just intersect them. And so, so I'll call this uh, lambda omega x, omega x check. As subrings of our series in H2. Yeah, well, I said. Mm -hmm. But it's the same cohomology, so. Yeah, um, so, so, yeah, you're right. So, so, let me write it down. So this is sum bi t to the ai, <laughs> bi is in k, ai is an H2, Xz, which is canonically identified with H2, X check Z. And I require that the minimum of omega X, AI, omega X check, AI goes to infinity. Okay. Um, oh, yes. Excuse me. Oh, yes. Uh, so I thought in the beginning you said there was no canonical identification between X and X check. Are you picking an identification? Oh, yeah, I'm picking a birational transform. Yes, I'm picking an okay. I, I, I fix a birational transform between X and X check once and for all. Yes. Okay. And does this is this dependent on the choice or? Yeah, this will depend on the choice. Yes. So if Thank there you. are birational automorphisms, you know, you get different identifications. But not different uh, main results. Well, the main result will be the same, but the isomorphism in our main result will be different. But the isomorphism I, I produce is highly not explicit anyway. There's, there's just no way of computing it. Um, well, not at the moment, maybe in the future. So here's the main theorem. This is 2018. So there exists a lambda omega x, omega x check algebra z and algebra isomorphisms. So what I do is I take Z and I tensor it with each of the Novikov rings, lambda omega x, lambda omega x check, and I recover quantum cohomology. In your theorem, x and h, x and x checks are fixed. In this theorem. They're fixed and there's a fixed birational morphism between them. Okay. But then, why do you say that it, it exists? I don't understand. Uh, 
Yeah, because then it's given that data there exists. But it's definition is there. Sorry? But your definition is there, so why do you say that it exists? Uh, let me state the result and then and then um something that they do not. Yeah, let me state the result okay. and then we and then see see if that clar see if that helps. So we tensor a bit of spring and that's an algebra. Yeah. Okay, so I have this algebra. It sort of looks a bit like the intersection of the two quantum cohomology rings. Sort of morally, that's you know, roughly what's, that's what this is saying. But you know, but based more, you know, what I'm saying is, you know, you have this algebra Z by tensor with one Novikov ring, you get this one. The tensor with the other one, I get this one. Oh yeah, just because they're that's why in the case. In, in the corresponding cases, it's first first is a, a lambda omega x isomorphism, and second one is a, a lambda omega check, x check isomorphism. Yes. yes. Right. Because my talk is ninety minutes, I should do an example. So, the example will be the tier flops, just maybe one a tier flop or a bunch of them in the same H2 class. Yeah. You'll see what these cohomology rings look like and how they transform. Okay, so mention three example. So I'm going to have two y rational. Um, so so let x x check be dimension three, and there exists a class I'm going to call capital gamma. H to X Z, so that um, this is quite restrictive. So every connected uh, one dimensional sub variety um, representing gamma. Oh, um, in X and minus gamma in X check uh, is E1. And it has this normal bundle O minus one plus O minus one. So we just have a bunch of P1s and we're going to flop them in the tier flop sense. So the birational transform is a flop along these curves. So a birational transform so a birational isomorphism uh, is a flop along these curves. It will all be disjoint and everything. You just flop along. Okay, so the, this is our example, and so, and so, um, so we choose our basis. So, so well, so in dimension three, um, well, H zero isn't so interesting. H zero is Poincaré dual to H three is not so interesting. It's H two that's interesting when it comes to the quantum product. H two is isomorphic to 
OH4. I'll ignore the odd dimensional cohomology. Okay, so, so, so we'll just look at the quantum product. H2. So it's a map from H2 to H4. So we have um, so a homogeneous basis. So we have a basis. Um, I'll use these capital A's because very A K and H two. Oh yeah. Also notice that that H two is isomorphic to H two, and by Poincaré duality, H four is isomorphic to H four. So H two and H four in dimension three are isomorphic um, by, by, by Poincaré duality. So we choose this basis in H2, and this gives us a basis in H2 of X check as well. So I'm just identifying H2, and you know, and this, these, these are all isomorphic to H4. Um, well, I think they're like H2 classes. And then we have the dual basis, A1 hat, AK hat in H4 of X is isomorphic to H4 of X check. And, oh, I apologize to the people on Zoom. Now, the main theorem is highly non-explicit. So in this example, I'm just going to guess what Z is. And it was just a guess. So, 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 so Z has a product star Z, and we want to figure out what A I star Z A J is. This is the guess. This is a guess. So it's a corrected, the quantum cup product is a corrected cup product. Because when you look at constant curves, you just get the usual cup product. This is on X, this cup product. Plus, um, K delta zero I delta zero J. Uh, oh, uh, I'm going to add A zero here. Add A zero here. This is the unit. Um, so, so, so I'm going to let A zero be the unit. Zero. Um, is that what I want? No, 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 no. Sorry, no, no. That's not right. No, a zero is not the unit. A zero is in here, and I have a zero hat here, and a zero represents um, uh, gamma. And A0 hat represents the Poincaré dual of gamma. Okay, so this A0 here is to do with gamma. This is T to the gamma plus sum. Um, gamma is you're saying that it's H two plus. Eight, and how gamma is the H2 down? H lower two plus. And this, this is yeah. Poincaré dual. Uh, no, no, the, no, 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 three, right? Yeah, maybe A zero hat is one gradual to gamma.
IJ. So, so this is my guess at what A is, is the, the quantum product on Z is. So, so Z is um, cohomology, as a module, it's cohomology of X with coefficients in, in this intersection of Novik offerings. And then the structure constants on H2, these H2 classes has this expression, okay? So there's a sort of, to be like... this, is, this is just sort of curves away from gamma, away from these embedded curves representing gamma. And this is the sort of piece that comes from curves in gamma. And then to get the quantum cohomology groups, so what you do is, so um, maybe I need another board. So if you replace, so by replacing a zero with one over one minus t to the gamma a zero, we get quantum cohomology x and replacing a zero with uh, minus t to the minus gamma over one minus t to the minus gamma a zero gives quantum cohomology x check. So this is the example. And if you work it out and you open, you know, Morris, Morrison gave this, did this sort of calculation in some survey paper on neurosymmetry in the early nineties and you sort of work out these formulas and do these replacements, you get both, you, you, you get, you see how the quantum cohomology rings change. So, so, so notice this is a power series. When you do one over one minus something, it means, you know, it's just one plus T to the gamma plus T to the two gamma. So this is a, a power series in gamma. This is a power series in minus gamma. So, so we've done this sort of analytic, you know, this analytic continuation we've sort of continued from gamma to minus gamma here. But instead of doing analytic continuation, which is what the algebraic geometers do, you know, these are power series of the same. Um, what we did instead is look at the intersection of the Novik offerings, and, and we just did a replacement from Blakey's instead. Right. I like the a really explicit example. If I were, were to write down the quintic threefold, could I... oh yeah, I should have done that. I, I mean, you know, like, can you can one look this up? Did Morrison or someone like write? I, I think I think this stuff must be in the literature. I mean, a good example is you take this quintic threefold and you degenerate it so it has like ten rational double points. And you do, you know, all small resolutions one way, and then you do them all the other way, and you choose the correct one so that they're Kähler. You know, so, 1,024 possibilities, and only two of them are Kähler. And so you, I think in principle, you could do the entire calculation. I, I don't know if people have actually written that down. Great. So let's see how much time we have. So with for the remaining 45 minutes or so, I'll give an idea of the proof. The idea is to use FLIR theory. 
We're going to use Hamiltonian uh, for homology. So, all simple like geometers know, know this, but there's lots of algebraic geometers who don't. So, this is for you. Okay. So, we start with a symplectic manifold M omega. And we'll assume C1 is zero for just, it's defined for any C1, but I'm going to just assume C1 is zero that ensures that my group is graded. And I choose a Hamiltonian. H, B, it's a time dependent Hamiltonian. So the generators of flux homology are going to have one periodic orbits. So definition, a one periodic orbit <clears throat> So this is um, a flow line gamma. From R Z to M this family of vector fields. Okay, so these are the ones dual dual for this. And there are many sign conventions about dual. Some people put a I put a minus sign somewhere when I say dual. So for such an orbit, so, so we'll only look at we'll only look at one periodic orbits which are null homologous. So we'll only look at So to such an orbit, we can construct the action. So this is A of gamma. And this is defined to be minus the integral over sigma gamma tilde star of omega plus the integral for S1 of gamma of H. So sigma is a capping surface. So, so let's say gamma tilde to uh, M is a smooth map. This is a surface and gamma tilde restricted to the boundary of this surface is equal to gamma. So, so the boundary of this surface I identify with S1 with R mod Z. So I'm gonna identify the boundary of this surface with uh, R mod Z, and I just choose a sort of capping of gamma. So here's my periodic orbit gamma, and there's some surface gamma tilde that caps it because I'm assuming it's null homologous. It's not a gamma of age, it's age of gamma of T. Oh, what am I saying? Thank you. Thank you.
Great. So I want to define my Hamiltonian flow group. I want to define like this. So I'm going to write HF star, and I'm going to look at a particular action interval. This is my flow group. So the chain complex, this is the three, so as a as a vector space, this is a free um, graded a vector space. Generated by um, these these one periodic orbits together with a choice of capping. So actually, I didn't say this. I didn't say this. Let me go back. This A depends on gamma tilde. It doesn't depend on gamma. So I have to choose, if I, if I change sigma, I could say connect some sigma with another surface where the integral of omega over this surface is non-trivial and I get a different action value. So, so I'm gonna call this a capped orbit. So, so this peg, this gamma tilde this is called a capped orbit. So, there are infinitely many capped orbits because I can, you know, H2 is, if H2 is in, you know, non trivial, there are infinitely many capped orbits. So, so generated by capped orbits. Okay. And then I need to define the differential. So I have a vector space. Oh, oh, um, sorry, with gamma tilde, with A of gamma tilde in this interval. This. And then there's a differential, which is some count of curves. So I have a vector space with a basis. So uh, the differential is a matrix with respect to this basis. So differential matrix with respect to this basis. Um, whose um, gamma minus tilde, gamma plus tilde term. Yes. And I'm just going to draw a picture. I'm going to draw a cylinder. There's a map from R cross S1 to M. It's a picture. On this side, I have gamma minus. So it limits to gamma minus. Let's go to minus infinity. And it's to gamma plus. If you go to plus infinity, that satisfies some PDE. Okay, it satisfies some PDE, some elliptic PDE with asymptotic boundary conditions. I can write the PDE down, but it doesn't really mean much. Um, PD. Looks like the Cauchy Riemann equation. It's polymorphic, but there's a lower order term. This is where the sort of effectiveness is not going to be. You know, if you have some, you know, if you have something holomorphic, you have these effective curves, but if you deform equations with some lower order term, you know, non-effective curves might start popping up. 
be a gradient there instead of Hamiltonian vector field? Sorry? Shouldn't be a gradient there instead of convector field? Oh, probably. I should put probably some plus or minus there. Also, there's these cappings, sigma, sigma minus, and sigma plus. And when you put a capping on here, a capping on here, you require the resulting sphere to be null homologous. <laughs> They're not sphere necessarily. Uh, surface. surface. Yeah. Sorry, surface. Sorry, when you say it's, is that it's the number of such? Yeah, yeah. So it's the, the number of these things. Sorry. Yeah. So I have a question. So, like, usually all the time I, uh, that they've used this kind of capping, it's by not by surface. By this. So what yeah, you... the reason why I'm using surface is because I want my Novikov ring to be a completion of the group ring of H two, not pi two H two. Okay, so that's a, I'm afraid, lightning description of lightning thought, like, it's a very, very quick um, description of Hamiltonian flat chronology. This description somehow allow you to take uh, into account the genus in the product. You, you can't like define a product with higher genus counts like this. You, yeah, you have this, well, you know, you have this horrible sort of structure. I don't know what it's called. No. Probably has the word operad somewhere in it, right? <clears throat> and then you can put genus in. The usual pair of pens, right? You get some uh, higher genus objects because of the capings, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. But the, I think when, when um, when, when we say genus, usually we mean the cylinder. Yes, I, okay. the cylinder is gene zero. We, we will plug in the holes. Somehow the cappings are just homological. Sort of the, when it comes to the PDE, the sort of important part is the cylinder. Genus of the cylinder is important. So gene zero is much nicer than our genus. Okay, so what I want to do is use these Fleur groups to find something called symplectic homology, or I, I think people nowadays call it relative symplectic homology. So um, uh, I will say the names, but I won't write them down. So. Sort of a version of this was defined in the early 90s, essentially, by Fleur, Chilibak, Hofer, and other people. I don't know who else. Some other. Um, Zocchi, maybe. Yeah. And then um, there are sort of more modern sort of incarnations of this by Joel Groman, Sarah Venkatesh, and Utvar Gunesh. If you're interested, I like Umut Veral Gunish's thesis. I get my students to read his thesis. We're learning about this. So this will be an invariant associated to any compact subset of M. Let me just write down the definition. Um, 
what I write down is technically wrong, but it's fine. Symplectic homology. This is symplectic homology. A inside M. This is defined to be, well, limb, limb, limb. My paper, there's at some point there's eight limbs. Okay. Um, at the end is some flow group. Here, take a limit over some Hamiltonian so that H restricted to K is less than zero. Here, we take an inverse limit, A minus goes to minus infinity. Here, we take a direct limit, A plus goes to plus infinity. The maps in these directed systems here and here they're not too hard to define. They're just sort of natural inclusions of the chain complexes. You just sort of look at the definition of Hamiltonian flow, homology, and it's sort of fine. This is more challenging. There are maps called continuation maps. If I increase my, if I have an increasing family of Hamiltonians, I get a natural map. I count some cylinders satisfying some other PDE, where this H is now sort of family of Hamiltonians increasing. And um, then I get maps and I take the direct limit. Um, so this, why I said, sorry. So you just follow the, uh, everybody. So the idea here actually is that you have it, let's say you have a compact subset in M and then you wish actually to, to somehow to, um, to get the, suppose it's a full, a full dimension. So, you, so then the boundary of K would be uh, of code dimension one. And then you have the, you have a, a, a sympathetic flow naturally defined on this without any uh, assumption. And you wish to recover somehow the, the periodic orbit of that. And this is exactly what, what, what this does. You have H, which is smaller than zero, and then near the boundary of K, then H increase very, very quickly. And then you, because of that, you, you, you get a sequence of periodic orb, of, of these uh, periodic orbit of the, on, the bar, on the boundary of K, which is independent of H. So that's that's more or less the idea. Here's the picture. Yeah, that's the picture. Yeah. So H is less than zero on K. K is um, I got colored chalk. So if H, you know, H away from K and inside K is C2 small, so there's just a couple of constant orbits, or there's constant basically. But near here and near here, uh, the orbits sort of sort of go around K really fast, sort of dynamics. K is like a co-dimension zero submanifold, as Francois said. It's a sort of natural foliation on the boundary, and it's sort of you're sort of essentially studying the orbits of this foliation, roughly. Very good. So yeah, that was the original motivation to study the dynamics on the boundary. Okay. Right. Okay, so that's relative symplectic homology. Oh, maybe I'll go back to this board. I just want to say one more thing. So really, you should really take these limits at a sort of chain level and take homology last. In my paper, I don't. I just write it like this, and it's perfectly fine in the paper. But morally, that's not the best. It doesn't have the best properties.
Great. Let's see how much time I have here. Okay, 20 minutes. So what I'll do is I'll explain, I'll just list some properties of this group. I'll label those properties one to six, and then I'll give a sort of sketch of the proof of the theorem with a couple of lies. Okay. The first one is there's an algebra over this Novikov ring. So it has a product, and product satisfying some PDE like this, you know, limiting to these orbits, products, the structure constants of a product are triple, you know, something indexed by have three indices. Uh, this is functorial with respect to inclusion. So if I have a smaller compact subset to a bigger one, it's functorial. This is called the, the transfer map. And sort of, you know, essentially it's a, or the turbo transfer map or something like this. Okay, and the third property connects what we have with quantum cohomology. It's H star M inside M is isomorphic to quantum cohomology of M. There's no boundary? M has no boundary. M is closed, yes. Is it easy to describe what you were discussing before with a condition on H? Or... Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, say that again? The limit over H is, is that degenerate in this? So, so the H is, you know, so this goes, this goes closer and closer to K and these top, these things go up and up and up. K is the whole thing now, so. Yeah, well, if K is the whole thing, that all if K is the whole thing, all the Hamiltonians are less than zero, and and it's sort of, you know, C infinity converges to zero, and and if you look at the, you know, the, the best way of computing this is you look at you have some tiny Hamiltonian and you multiply it by epsilon, and you let epsilon go to zero, and then it, you know you can assume H is autonomous, so it's time independent, and you, the only orbits are critical points. And it's identified with something called Morse homology. Um... So yes, exactly. Just, okay, so, yeah. that's, so it's Morse. Yeah. So actually, in this picture of there, in this picture of there, it, so the the H is very close to zero, but not zero. Okay? Uh -huh. Not because then it would be generated, degenerated. So it's very close to zero in such a way that it's so close to zero that C one C infinity close to zero, so that the periodic orbit of the Hamiltonian just catch the, the critical point of H. Okay. okay, so if you don't get any other periodic orbit because it, the, the flow is too slow, because the, the, the slope of H is too, the gradient, simply gradient is too small. So you so inside, inside K and outside of K, you just get the ordinary homology, okay, of K and uh, what is outside of K. And this is the trivial part of the homology. And now you get the interesting part just on the boundary. That's the idea. Okay, great. Yeah, so three. So, so everything else, it's more small homology, but then close to uh, the boundary. Okay, it's it's flow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, if I drew a line like that, that's a Morse flow line, approximately. It's these 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 um flow cylinders, they they rotation invariant. They map to a line. And they look like a Morse flow line.
Okay, three more properties. Then the remaining three properties are more complicated. So you need a bit more explanation. So the next property is called the stable displaceability property. Um, uh, so let me give you a definition first. Subset. Stably displacing. There exists Hamiltonian diffeomorphism B, not on M, but on M plus <coughs> the cut tangent bundle of S1. So that B A cross S1 set. A cross S1, the empty set. Now, why do I stably displace something? So the reason why I stably displace something is because I will have things that I want to displace, but for topological reasons, I can't do it. If I take something, you know, for, for instance, I could take a hypersurface in Pn. A could be a hypersurface in Pn. Well, that's, that's not displaceable from itself because its intersection number with itself is non trivial. But if I cross with S1, well, topologically, I can displace it from itself just by shrinking the S1. And actually, in that case, I can Hamiltonian displace it from itself. Okay. So um, I'll state a fact about that later. I have enough time. So if M minus K bar stably displaceable, then Uh, we remember from property two, we have this transfer map, and it's an isomorphism. And in particular, remember this is isomorphic to quantum cohomology. So if I have a complement is stably displaceable, this is isomorphic to quantum cohomology. This is my property uh, three. Uh oh, oh, there we go. Um, in the interests of time, I'm going to define this, define everything here. So, um, well, maybe I should say something. No, no, I'll just, I'll just state the property. So suppose E0 inside E1 inside M, are index bounded Mouville domains. I'm not going to define that. Maybe I'll say it in words for the symplectic geometer. So you have Louisville domains and compact subsets, compact submanifolds with boundary. Index bounded means that there are only finitely many label orbits of. Um, uh, so, so that it's so, um, um, basically there are only finally many ray orbits of each index. The 
there's a sort of, I, although I allow it to be degenerate, so, so, uh, so, so, so it's not quite what I, I mean, morally it's basically that. Just a quick question, question, if you don't have an answer, that's okay. Do you have an example where it is uh, stably displaceable, but not displaceable? Yes. Okay. CP1 inside CP2. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Um, suppose, okay, there's another techn technical definition, D1 minus D0 is a trivial Louisville herbordism. I'm not going to define that. Technical conditions. So then... The index bounded condition here is crucial. If you drop that, this is not true. Uh, yeah, one last property. Again, in the interests of time, I will just say a lot of technical words and incantations and so on. Okay. okay, so this this is another this is a technical condition. So one of the problems, um maybe I should show people on Zoom as well. So one of the problems, actually kind of irritating problem I find with um, this relative symplectic cohomology is you, you have this sort of foliation on the boundary of K and two copies of each orbit of this foliation are sort of seen here. And also two copies are seen up here. These orbits up here are badly behaved and we always want that, I want those to go away. Also, I want these constant things to go away. I want somehow this Hamiltonian to be identically zero, that constant there, you know, not non-degenerate. That's a sort of irritating condition. It's a sort of nice thing I want, and it's, it's hard work to get it back. So, um, yeah. So let me just copy this. So let the Using the word V here because um, it's the same, going to be the same V as I wrote earlier. Here I had a Calabi Yau manifold and I had V here, and it's a union of um, ma manifolds. It has this Whitney stratification. And so we're going to let J be omega compatible, almost complex structure. Um, I say this. Maybe, <clears throat> Maybe I, I think what I'm going to do is just I'm going to sketch the proof and I'm just going to say what I need in the proof instead of stating this property. It's something to be better helpful anyway. Okay. So let's prove our theorem. So, so by, by the properties, so, so, so we have X, and this is birational to X check, birationally isomorphic to, to X check. And so by the axioms above, oh yeah, so, so, um, okay. 
So what we do is we choose a... Um, you know, just saying a few words, uh, you called the fair, the, the, the statement. Oh, yeah. oh, did I erase it? Oh, yeah. That's just saying words. So there's an algebra Z yeah. so that C tensor lambda omega x is quantum cohomology of x Z tensor omega x check is quantum cohomology check. So we need to work out what the Z is. And the claim is Z is going to be some symplectic cohomology, relative symplectic cohomology group. So what do we do? Um, I think I'm running out of time. You still have got five and minutes. Or a bit more, yeah. OK, so I'm going to draw a picture and just start talking. So. I'm going to draw X, a blob, X check, is another blob. Now, these two blobs are identical except for V and V check. So I have some horribly singular subset V, probably singular sub variety V check, and away from these green regions, they're isomorphic, okay? What I do next is I choose away from V and V check, a common affine variety, sub variety. So I can do that because it's projective. A common affine sub variety, A. Call it A in both of them. Away from V and V check. Now, inside this affine sub variety, I have. So, so affine varieties are examples of, um, you know, you can embed affine varieties in CN. By definition, you can embed them in CN and they have a and what I do is, what you do is you choose a really large ball in CN and intersect those affine varieties, with that really, really large ball, and you get a sort of Louisville domain. We have the Louisville domain here, say D0, Louisville domain here, one. The Louisville domains sort of represent these affine varieties. They're sort of, they're sort of deformation equivalent Louisville domains, essentially. And, and these are index bounded. You can make these with some work, you can make these index bounded with a lot of work. So you have two common Louisville domains inside both projective varieties. So we can look at symplectic homology. V0 side. X, symplectic homology, one inside. So, so symplectic homology, <coughs> D0 and X, <coughs> symplectic homology of D1 inside X. Now, if D0 is really, really big, well, the complement. <clears throat> inside the X check. X check, yeah. Should have called that D and G check. Um, let me go into the next board and. Hmm. I, let me go to the. I want to keep all the axioms up. So, 
It was the third board of second. Only, only the third board. So here's a here's a here's a fact which which I'm going to use. Every co-dimension greater than zero subvariety of Taylor manifold is stably displacing. There in my paper. You wrote that. Yes. For instance, P1 inside P2. Okay. You mean a complex submanifold or? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Taylor manifold. So, but the sub variety, what does that say? Sub manifold or sub, sub variety? Sub variety. So it could be, so it could be like a Lagrangian or something. Yeah, it could be Singer. So let's go back to the first board. So, so sub variety means it could be singular or anything, right? Any, sing any kind of singularity you like. As long as it's positive co-dimension and complex in a certain and sense. yes, yeah, sub variety yeah. means complex. Yeah. <laughs> I think for smooth there was some argument of Borel was yeah. So so there's a there's a there's an argument by uh, well, yeah La, yes Sikorov and and Lalon no no not you no, no. 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 Sikorov and and who Laudenbach Laudenbach that's right. So, so they they have a proof where they. They use ideas of Dennis Sullivan to, to displace it, and they can infinitesimally displace it. That doesn't work here because you could have like say two P1s like this inside CP2, and you can't, you know, whatever you do, it intersects itself. So you have to do something a bit more drastic. Um, you, you essentially it's like an H principle when you cross with S zero, and you sort of use an H principle to sort of move on. When you cross with S one, you cross with S one and displace it. So. Yeah. So you yeah. sort of it's sort of it's a sort of H principle kind of idea. Um, so let's go back to this picture. We have SH star D0 in X, SH star D1 in X. And if say D0 is sufficiently big. So at the moment, you know, D0 could be quite small, but I could enlarge it so that it's very, very big. And the complement of A is stably displaceable. And so if D0 is sufficiently large, the complement will be stably displaceable too. So I can use property, what? Uh, yeah, I think it's- four. Property four. Yeah. <clears throat> To show this is isomorphic to quantum cohomology so by property four, but also by property five, because I have to sort of enlarge it, deform it. Um, this is quantum cohomology of X. And similarly here. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so it's property four, five, and three or something. Three, four, five. So I just need to compare this with this. Okay. So let me draw another picture. Sorry, I think I've run out of time. I'll just, it's okay. I want to draw one more picture. Raise probably five now. So. Same sort of colors. So let's say D, D0 or D1, so to say D0. Then we have A, and then outside of A, we have V, and um, we have our Hamiltonian in orange, no, the orange. It's 
So E0 is index bounded. That was a claim I made. It involves a fair amount of effort to prove. With an index bounded global domain, you can define symplectic cohomology so that these constant orbits are ignored and they're identically constant. Yeah. Okay. So you can ignore these outer orbits. Let me go back to the other picture and then I'll be done. Remember, with symplectic cohomology, as Francois was saying, you have sort of orbits near the boundary like this, non-trivial orbits, and you have flow trajectories connecting them. Now we have a flow trajectory connecting them. And B is co-dimension, real co-dimension four. Generically, this flow trajectory avoids B. And if you deform D0 and D1, so they're identical, you have the same orbits here, the same differential here, because it avoids V, and this one avoids V check, and these regions are the same. So you get the same groups. So these are the same, they're identical. You set things up correctly. I stop. Only one other point, you know, there's this change of Novikov coefficients hidden. Oh, sorry? There's a change of Novikov coefficients hidden in this identification, which I'm sweeping under the rug. So, are there? Yeah. Yes, so the zero and the one are actually the same, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah but but actually the, the way I do it, there's a sort of a symmetry because the, the, the symplectic forms here and here are completely different. Um, you, you know, like in the example, one was sort of, the sort of gamma component flips to minus the gamma component, essentially. Um, so you have to make them the same. This involves messing around with plurisubharmonic functions. And there you sort of have to break the symmetry. So you, you, you make this really big and this really, really small sort of near the skeleton. And, and then they're the same. But then this one, you have to sort of grow and use property five. To sort of, so, so there's some sort of shenanigans going on. Um, so you use property five to kind of sandwich one inside the other or something. Uh, yeah, so in my paper, I actually have I can't remember, like five liberal domains, and I've sort of sandwiched them all in, 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 the, in each other, and you can prove things are isomorphisms. And, and sort of, yeah, also to prove property five, you use a kind of sandwich property, sandwiching property. Um, yeah, so, so there's some sort of details I'm missing. Other questions? So if I wish to enjoy the coffee, we should, you don't you don't have the permission of asking about big chronology, okay? So, <laughs> it would be too long. So, uh, yes. I, I had a couple. Oh, yeah, Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, so one was, uh, uh, where did we use the Calabria assumption? Like, doesn't this work for any projective? Uh, oh, the Calabria that? assumption. You want C1 to be zero because you want these groups to be graded. And the reason why you want these groups to be graded is because you want to use this index bounded assumption. And when you drop this index bounded assumption, everything sort of goes wrong. There is a generalization of this conjecture by Ruan, which says if the two, if you have two smooth projective varieties and they're called K equivalent, which means the birational morphism preserves the canonical class then they have the same quantum cohomology groups. And I don't know how to prove that using this technology. I'm, I, I, I feel like if someone, maybe, you know, if someone was really industrious and they really understood what was going on and they had some additional ideas that I'm not aware of, then maybe it could be proved using these techniques. But at the moment, uh, this index bounded assumption is crucial in a couple of places. So for property five, which I raised. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's maybe it's, yeah. 
Uh, so one more uh, question I had was, so I say I have like a toric degeneration of like K3s. So I have a family of K3s that like degenerate, uh, like there's some 24 singular points. I do small blow up on them. So I get like two calabiaus. Uh, I mean, I didn't do an atia flop of this. So I get two calabiaus that way. Can you be explicit in this example and tell me like what the A's and the T0s would be? Well, yeah, so I don't quite know how to connect the example I did with mm -hmm. this picture. I, no. I feel you could do it in principle in the sense that there should be some kind of description of symplectic homology in terms of chain level log Grom of Witten invariance. Maybe if you had that description, maybe in an example like this, a TF flop example, you could actually connect it. You, know, you could actually compute what Z is and what these isomorphisms are. Um, I don't know how to do that. Okay, maybe a last question. That's good. Last question. So uh, you, you mentioned uh, about something about these two generators. Yeah. For, yes. Yeah. For, so uh, if you work with a characteristic zero, right, you can do a S1 equivariant yes. theory. Uh, yeah, so I, I could have done S1 equivariant, but then there's still, you know, I said there's four generators. And S1 equivariant, there's still two, inner and outer, and the outer ones are the problematic. You know, they create all kinds of, I mean, it creates trouble. And... Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you. <laughs>